So this uh, scene in John's gospel is a vivid one for me. And after having sat with it on several drives to and from Tulsa this week, um, I'd have to say the most grounding vantage point I thought of was when I was passing the QT northbound on my way back to Bartlesville. So as the prairie faded into the distance, it went something like this. A young man in his early 20s rolled over, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Yesterday was a hard day. It was a long day for him. He could still feel the weariness in his limbs. Passover in Jerusalem was always busy. The smell of bread urging him into his sandals. He picked up a small round loaf from the warming stone and held it to his cheek. It made him smile. He ate hurriedly as he fastened his belt. He was late. It was already the third hour, just after 9 a.m. And he still needed to create the doves and wash before heading to the temple. He opened the door to the courtyard, finding two crates lined with pitch ready to go. He carefully handled the birds, perched in their makeshift cage, one by one placing them inside the traveling crates. Looking over his shoulder every so often, he noticed that the street just outside had begun to fill up. Once the birds were safely inside their cages, he placed a small dark cloth over the crates and then returned to his cot, retrieving a small leather purse. He dumped the contents into his palm, five shekels, two silver half shekels, a bronze pruta, and four leptons. Leptons were often used in exchange for public baths. At least he'd be clean, he thought. There was no time to lose. He fastened his purse strings around his belt, grabbed the crates just outside the door, and entered the street. Streets were jammed. A sea of humanity filled them. He took an alley just east of the family compound. If he could get to the end of the alley before the sun rose over the rooftop, he might just have enough time to reach the court of the Gentiles before the day's sacrifices began. To his amazement, the crowds began to thin as he approached the temple gates. Travelers from the Galilee were on both sides of their old road. The air was thick with the smell of meat. He hiked the crates a little higher out away from his hips, walking as fast as he could until he was almost running. The court of the Gentiles was just ahead. He could see the gates. Then he stopped. The gate was flung open. Standing in the middle of the thoroughfare was a single goat chewing its cud. He approached the animal hesitantly. He was alert. Something was wrong. The goat bayed at him as he passed. He was still looking at the animal when suddenly he ran into the column holding up the portico. More embarrassed than hurt, his eyes began to focus on what lay before him. Pandemonium. Birds were perched atop the gates and flocks. Cattle meandered in between overturned tables. Shekels, arii, drachma lay in heaps on the pavers. Money scattered as if flung. Donkey was loose. 
its owner failing to get a hold of him before ran it, running past the man. Someone in the corner roared with laughter while others were feeling, fleeing with the possessions they could grab. The court should have been packed that day. Instead, it was empty, save for the money changers trying to figure out whose coin was whose and the vendors that were in hot pursuit of their wares on four legs. And then I lost it, as sure as I turned down Ninth Street. I didn't go in the church um, Friday morning. Instead, I got out and I walked over here and I looked at Hope Presbyterian. And I weighed my, made my way around the alleyway and out into the front parking lot. And I looked towards First Presbyterian. I knew the Catholic Church was over here and I think I was looking at what was First Methodist before it moved. And you know, I thought to myself, there's a lot of churches in this town. A lot of temples. But what is more is that churches on Fridays these days are quiet. And there are times when I expect I'm like the dove seller arriving at the gate. You know, we've heard with well-meaning intent, and I need for you to hear me on this, with well-meaning intent, that the story of the cleansing of the temple gives us an example of Jesus' anger and hence his humanity. Jesus' actions of taking the whip, driving out the goats and the cattle and the sheep, are evidence to us that Jesus could get really mad. We do this with other emotions too. Jesus wept. The Savior cries. And we have this tendency then to build up this catalog of emotion in order to prove to ourselves something that we already know. That the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I would suggest to you what we seek more in moments void of a foothold is whether or not we did all that we could do. Are we justified in our anger is really what we want to know. And deep down at your center, only you know the answer to that question. As your friend, I would say to you that you need to feel what you need to feel. And you need to trust that just as your humanity, who you are, pervades everything you do, so does the Savior's. For some, that is anger. For some, that's not. All your feelings are valid. And thus, Jesus' anger in this moment is not the scandal that we sometimes make it out to be. Just before her death, brought on by a glioblastoma, the dean of Wake Forest Divinity School wrote this. The scandal of this moment, this one right here, is the authority that this human being claims for himself through his words and his deeds. Jesus, a complete outsider to the power structure of the temple, issues a challenge directly to the temple authority 
that quite literally shakes it to its very foundations. Jesus throws the mechanics of temple worship into chaos. No sacrifices. No tithing were done that day. It was one of the most significant feasts of the year. And Jesus goes on to explain his actions by pointing to his death and resurrection. And you know what? They don't get it. I imagine if we were there, we wouldn't have gotten that either. The gospel instead bears witness to the fact that Jesus has the authority to change to challenge the temple authority because his whole life gives witness to God. Jesus' bold prophetic act in the temple reinforces what the scripture has already shown us. There will be nothing hidden in Jesus. Jesus is the locus of God's presence on earth and God as known in Jesus. Not the temple. Is where the activity is to be. If such remains true, then the words, I desire mercy and not sacrifice should remain ever before us. And much will depend on what we lean into, what we believe, and what we do in the moments after the tables have been turned over on us. Because it's gonna happen if it already hasn't happened already. Everything, whether it's our cross to bear, the suffering of those we love, the death of all that we hold dear, that meaning is ultimately challenged by the revelation of God in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know, Unless you're selling something you shouldn't, that's good news. <laughs>